Hey, welcome to Crossroads. Folks, there was a judge in one of the January 6 cases who tried making it so they could monitor the computer of one of the defendants, a guy accused of just entering the building, uh, for so-called disinformation. And this judge trying to act as the thought police over the whole January 6 narrative, it seems, was shot down by an appeals court. Let me show you. Now look, basically what happened a judge focused on January 6 cases was prevented from acting is what people are calling the Ministry of Truth after a decision from the U.S. Court of Appeals. This is District Judge Reggie Walton. And he included a ruling to monitor the computer of Daniel Goodwin. And all Daniel did, according to, again, what he pled guilty to, was entered the Capitol building on January 6. The judge accused him of spreading disinformation when he did an interview on Tucker Carlson tonight. Yeah, how dare he go talk to the media about what actually took place, right? Regardless, here's what Epic Times says. They say a sentencing requirement that January 6th defendant Daniel Goodwin have his computer monitored by the government for disinformation has been vacated by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District, uh, the District of Columbia Circuit. In other words... Court of Appeals says this is nonsense, you don't have the jurisdiction for this, shut down. Now it says the court on March 26 published a mandate sending the case back to U.S. District Judge uh, Reggie Walton to remove the computer monitoring requirement that he issued as part of his sentencing uh, judgment in the case on January 15, 2023. Now here's how it went down. Further, it says that a three-judge panel of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled the judge plainly erred in imposing the computer monitoring. Judge Gregory Katsis, Naomi Rao, and Bradley Garcia issued a per curiam order vacating the monitoring provision. Judge Walton, the one who put it in place in the first place, when imposing a 60-day prison sentence in June 2023 for trespassing, by the way, said Mr. Goodwin spread disinformation during a broadcast of Tucker Carlson tonight on March 14th, 2023. Judge Walton ordered that Mr. Goodwin's computer be subject to monitoring and inspection. Monitoring meaning they watch you in real time, I suppose, right? If they're monitoring you. And then inspection, suggesting they have to actually, you know, go and physically look at the computer. And that had to be done, he said, by a probation agent to check if he was spreading January 6 disinformation during the term of a supervised release. Now, how do they decide what disinformation is? How does this agent, the one they you know, assigned to this, right, the probation agent, how does that guy decide what is true and what is false? Who is this individual to believe that he has a better sense of what took place on January 6 than the journalists who cover it, who Mr. Goodwin might be speaking to, right? It says the judge also referred to Mr. Goodwin spreading alleged misinformation using the term interchangeably with disinformation, uh, which suggests that this judge actually has no idea what either of these terms actually mean. If he thinks that misinformation and disinformation are the same thing, he doesn't know what they mean, frankly. Uh, misinformation, of course, being just outright false information, often done with the intent of maybe muddying a topic and disinformation being basically changing the footnotes of an argument, either with staged events, sound familiar, uh, or for example, with creating narratives around falsehoods. Uh, he doesn't seem to understand the difference between these two things, but regardless, it says Mr. Goodwin, 35 of Corinth, Texas, pleaded guilty on January 1st, 2023, to one misdemeanor count of entering and remaining in a restricted building or grounds without lawful authority. The charge could have meant up to a year in prison. On June 6, 2023, Judge Walton sentenced Mr. Goodwin to 60 days in prison, a year of supervised release, a $2,500 fine, and a $500 restitution payment. Folks, keep in mind, these are some of the same courts that just have a revolving door for robbery and physical violence and stealing cars and the whole nine yards. This is like the same area where people get away with just about everything, and a guy trespassing gets treated like this, right? But further it says, it was Mr. Goodwin's appearance on Mr. Carlson's Fox News program. 
Uh, Mr. Goodwin, the guy accused of all this, went on Fox News and talked to Tucker Carlson. And it says that that drew some of the sharpest fire from Judge Walton. Judge Walton took issue with this guy, of course, going through the whole legal process and then going and talking to journalists and saying something he didn't like being said. He called Mr. Carlson a lightning rod who has said and done things that, that the judge thinks, quote, clearly have been divisive. I would argue this judge is being severely divisive uh, because a lot of these J6 judges are not allowing the cases to be, again, tried in local courts. They're making sure they keep every single thing under their purview. They're not letting anything leave Washington. And I would say, frankly, where the jury pool is tainted, where the judges have expressed clear bias and their assumptions of what actually took place that day, oftentimes I would say based on clear misunderstandings and severe misrepresentations of the basic facts, especially when Congress under the January 6th committee has been muddying the waters, spreading falsehoods, deleting evidence, altering evidence in the whole nine yards, and the corrupt narratives from these corrupt individuals has tainted, again, jury pools, and I would say even possibly tainted the opinions of these judges. But it says that Mr. Carlson gave the impression that, quote, according to this judge, Individuals who have been charged in reference to the events on January 6th of 2021 have been treated unfairly. How dare a journalist suggest that people have been treated unfairly? And the judge who, mind you, oversaw the case said, I see no evidence of that, in fact, was the case. Okay, so they're accusing the judge of treating these individuals unfairly, and the judge judging himself in this case, meaning he's placing himself within the case, said, I see no evidence that, in fact, was the case. And because the judge feels that he treated everything completely fairly and he doesn't like being criticized by the media for this, he then says that they have to monitor the computer of this individual who went through his court. Something which, of course, is just ridiculous, frankly, since when can a judge uh, become the gatekeeper of information? Since when can a judge decide what is true and what's false? And since when can a judge decide who can talk to the media and who cannot? But it says that when being interviewed by Mr. Carlson, Mr. Goodwin, may, quote, made no attempt to correct the record, Judge Walton said. And when Carlson suggested that all the defendant did was go into the Capitol and walk around for less than a minute and leave, that just wasn't correct, and that misinformation that is disseminated to the American public has contributed to the discord that now exists in our country in reference to the presidential election and what occurred on January 6th, he said. That's according to the judge. In my personal opinion, in that very statement, the judge expresses a clear misunderstanding of what took place on January 6th and a clear opinion of what took place that would taint his judgment on any other case. The opinion he's expressing in this regard right now uh, shows only one side of the opinions of the aisle. And of course, that opinion is based on a narrative framed by altered evidence, destroyed evidence, withheld evidence, evidence not provided to defense attorneys, defense attorneys not being able to express certain things, oftentimes at the order of different judges. And of course, individuals who are being charged with a crime that has never been applied in this sense, right? Disrupting an official proceeding made for Enron and destroying evidence, not for protesting Congress or whatever. Uh, all these novel interpretations, and the judge takes no issue with that. The judge takes no issue with the January 6th committee destroying evidence and possibly tainting the jury pools. The judge takes no evidence in lawyers not being able to get exculpatory evidence, evidence being withheld notably by Congress in some regards. Why are these things not taken into account? Why are these things not problems of the information that's being used to judge these cases? Why is it the judge does not have problems with those types of disinformation, I would question. Because I think if you look at the full context of what actually took place on January 6th, you'll find the prevailing narratives are outright false. And I would say also, again, formed even by things that are technically illegal. For example, members of Congress on the former January 6th committee destroying evidence, withholding evidence, altering evidence, false testimony being used to create their opinions, and those opinions then being used to feed into the court cases. Technically, in my opinion, this whole thing is fruit of the poisonous tree and should be thrown out. And shame on these judges for not taking these things into consideration 
more seriously. And frankly, I think that once the tables do turn and once people do see the evidence and once investigations, real ones start, these individuals are actually facing really serious charges themselves. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute because RFK Jr., Trump, a lot of people are suggesting that once they get into office, if they do, whether it's Trump or RFK Jr., they are going to investigate this. And frankly, abuse of power, misuse of justice, corruption, and so on, all of these things are going to be looked at. Now, folks, don't forget, as all of this unfolds about January 6th, again, the Epic Times is at the forefront of reporting of what happened. I did three special features, two documentaries of those, uh, in it on you know, myself and with my colleagues. We've had hundreds, right? Sorry, we've had countless reports on what happened that day. And if you want to stay informed about what's unfolding, remember, folks, we got the unreleased footage from Congress. Epic Times is only one of only three media that was given access to all the footage that was withheld from the public. When I say these things, I'm saying these things based on an understanding of what the public was not shown. And frankly, if you look at the two documentaries we've done and the special feature we've done, uh, we actually showed a lot of that unreleased footage. In the first documentary, The Real Story of January 6th, uh, we showed evidence of abuse of force, uh, abuse and use of force, possible entrapment. In the second one, the special feature we did, we showed full unedited clips, uh, even showing multiple regions and multiple areas of the Capitol that day, how different narratives unfolded. And we demonstrate with clear and irrefutable evidence that the prevailing narratives, many of them are false. And in the third one, the last documentary we did on January 6th, which I recommend you seriously watch, uh, we show how the legal system is being abused. And when I say that these judges are making decisions based on unstable legal grounds, and frankly, may themselves even be committing crimes while doing these types of things, and maybe should be investigated for it. I am saying this based on clear evidence, not just opinion. I would say that again, in the footage, in the uh, research we've done, in the investigations we've done, we've demonstrated that there is clear evidence of abuse of power, uh, that cases are not being looked at fairly, that evidence is being withheld from lawyers, and that people are not able to properly present cases. This stuff is very serious, frankly. And again, in our research and our reporting, uh, in our documentaries, we've expressed a lot of these things, and I think the evidence is there now. So make sure to join us on Epic TV for that. Again, link is in the description below. And real quick too, those of you on YouTube Rumble, we're gonna uh, we're staying on uh, the channels today, so don't go anywhere. We're doing the full episode today on these channels. But now in other news, speaking of RFK Jr. He is now saying that if he wins the presidency, he plans to investigate the weaponization of government. And yes, he is also planning to investigate the entire way that the January 6th narrative was created. Because he's suggesting that the whole thing doesn't, doesn't hold water, frankly. As more evidence comes out, we're finding the public appears to have been lied to. And people are coming to understand this now, even people who normally would not agree with it. I'll be talking more about this, though, after a quick word from our sponsor, so don't go anywhere. We'll be back shortly after this. Experts agree. One of the best ways to protect against financial uncertainty is to diversify your portfolio. Learn how physical gold and silver can secure your retirement funds from today's economic challenges with a gold IRA from American Hartford Gold. You can safeguard your wealth with no penalties or taxes when you transfer your current qualifying retirement accounts. Call now and our precious metals specialists will send you a free information kit, no cost or obligation. American Hartford Gold, a trusted industry leader with an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, has a five-star rating from thousands of happy clients. Whether you are getting physical precious metals in a gold IRA or delivered to your doorstep, we offer only the highest quality gold and silver. For your peace of mind, we also offer a no-fee buyback commitment, a low-price guarantee, along with free shipping and free insurance. So don't wait. Call the number on your screen today and secure your financial future. Welcome back. RFK Jr. is now saying that if he wins the presidency very soon, he plans to investigate the weaponization of government. 
And remember, folks, this isn't just, again, Republican and Democrat anymore. It's Republican, Democrat, and Independent. Because RFK Jr. is actually playing a pretty big role in the elections and is mostly going to be taking Democrat votes, meaning the opinions he expresses are also going to be what the Democrat, normally voters, uh, who are going for him, maybe some Republicans as well, are also going to be demanding, meaning January 6th is no longer just a partisan issue. Now, RFK Jr. doesn't seem to agree with the whole narrative being pushed over January 6th. Let me show you what he's saying. Fox News said this, independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on Friday said he is disturbed by the weaponization of government against former President Donald Trump. He also vowed that if elected president, he would appoint a special counsel to investigate whether prosecutorial discretion was, be, was abused for political ends in cases related to the January 6th Capitol riot. And frankly, Back to the point I just made about this judge trying to monitor this guy's, uh, you know, computer for so-called disinformation because the guy went and talked to Tucker Carlson and said that there was maybe some misconduct in the judgment. And the judge was like, well, I judge that and there's no misconduct. Uh, maybe this would relate to that, frankly. Whether, again, prosecutorial discretion was abused. That means judges and so on. Kennedy on Friday issued a statement in an effort to clarify his views on the events of January 6, 2021, and he said this, quote, this is RFK Jr., folks. He said, January 6 is one of the most polarizing topics on the political landscape. I am listening to people of diverse opinions on it in order to make sense of, what, of the event and what followed. I want to hear every side. And he added that it is, quote, quite clear that many of the January 6th protesters broke the law and what may have started as a protest but turned into a riot. But he added, like many reasonable Americans, I am concerned about the possibility that political objectives motivated the vigor of the prosecution of the January 6th defendants. Get that, folks. That means judges and so on and people calling for the charges and the nature of the charges. And he continues, quote, their long sentences and their harsh treatment, suggesting both of these could be elements of, again, prosecutorial misconduct, meaning judges doing things based on politics, not based on a just rational vision of the law. Now, he added, quote, that would fit a disturbing pattern of the weaponization of government agencies. The DOJ, Department of Justice, the IRS, the SEC, the FBI, etc. against political opponents. In other words, he's framing this prosecutorial misconduct, which I believe is what is taking place. He is framing that as a part of a bigger picture, maybe a, a racketeering type picture, right? Like a RICO type picture where individuals are acting in conjunction with each other using the levers of power they've been given whether it's at the FBI, whether it's in the DOJ, uh, whether it's in, for example, the courts, that these individuals are working in cahoots with each other in order to enact political law against the individual they hate and the individual who is the main political enemy of their party, Donald J. Trump. And the Trump supporters are kind of the sacrificial lambs needed to slay at the altar to try to get Trump thrown in prison and, of course, made so that he can't run for president yet again. And then, of course, that agenda is kind of off the table now. But without a doubt, that did seem to be what they were trying for, or at least many of them were for a very long time. But back to RFK Jr., he said that, according to Fox News, he opposes Trump and all he stands for. He is still, quote, disturbed by the weaponization of the government against him, regardless of that, though. And he said, quote, as president, RFK Jr. said this, I will appoint a special counsel, an individual respected by all sides, to investigate whether prosecutorial discretion was abused for political ends in this case, and I will right any wrongs that we discover. Kennedy said, and he said, quote, without the impartial rule of law, there is no true democracy or moral governance. And I would agree with him on that, actually. Now, on the topic of RFK Jr. a bit more, the Biden administration is actually starting to get really concerned uh, that is, he's running as an independent and could possibly hand the presidency to Donald Trump. Now, look, personally, I'd say it goes deeper than even this, because guess what? 
If RFK Jr. wins a decent amount of Democrat votes, maybe 10%, 15%, maybe even 25%, maybe more, who knows? Uh, maybe it could be a Trump 2016 type phenomenon where they're you know, the corrupt media were saying that Trump has like a 2% chance of winning and he won by a landslide. Maybe this is skewed polls. Maybe it's, of course, a miscalculation by the many thinkers on the, you know, the official positions. Maybe they're miscalculating the popularity of RFK Jr. among Democrats, in other words. But this could lead to a serious blow for the Democrat Party if he takes enough votes from the main party. Because America would go, in this case, from being a two-party system to a three-party system. And yes, I'm aware we have the Libertarian Party and kind of the Tea Party and the Green Party. But what RFK Jr. would represent is possibly a larger party that is mainly a breakaway from the Democrats. Suggesting he would divide the Democrat Party specifically. Now, AFP on Yahoo notes that Armed with the most storied surname in U.S. politics, Robert F. Kennedy's uh, wild card shot for the presidency holds a clear and present danger for Joe Biden's hopes of a second term in the White House. He says the environmental lawyer and conspiracy theorist, according to AFP, I'd say that's opinion disguised as news, is boasting double-digit support and polling suggests that independent candidate RFK Jr. is hurting the presidency more than Republican challenger Donald Trump. Like, it should comment on the conspiracy theorist thing, folks. I'd say AFP, in this regard, is acting more as a conspiracy theorist than RFK Jr. is. This is one of the ways that these corrupt corporate media frame narratives. The media goes and creates a label, oftentimes based on false premise. What is the premise for RFK Jr.? RFK Jr. has questioned the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. Hey, I'd say based on the evidence that has emerged, we now know that there's reason to question it. Frankly, I'd say that most of the media got the stories wrong. I'd say AFP got more stories wrong than RFK Jr. has, by the way. I'd say that the establishment media did a lot worse lying to us about face masks, lying to us about their e efficacy, lying to us about the efficacy of the vaccine, lying to us about the booster shots, lying to us about the efficacy of lockdowns, and so on and so on and so on. I'd say they're the conspiracy theorists. But regardless, they used this narrative to frame RFK Jr. while not acting in independence from official statements from U.S. officials, right? One of the basic functions journalists should have is independence of thought and independence of narrative. Not framing things and just saying whatever the party says is right. You know, we're not a communist country. We can think for ourselves and the party is not always right as it is under communism and you have to say that, right? These lapdogs of totalitarianism go and frame themselves as journalists and then attack anybody who steps out of the party line. And frankly, I'd say that's exactly what they did with labeling RFK Jr. as a conspiracy theorist. Now, look, like him or not, you know, um, you know it's your opinion, of course, uh, they're misframing him in this regard, at least in my opinion, right? In my, in my independent assessment. But regardless, I'd say they're right about this because they are suggesting that RFK Jr. is hurting Joe Biden a whole lot more than he's going to be hurting the, the uh, campaign of Donald J. Trump, which frankly I'd say is maybe the reason why they're attacking him. Because again, uh, the Biden administration is actually launching a full campaign to try to tear down RFK Jr. And it's interesting now to see that the establishment media is circling the wagons around that agenda. But here's what they say, quote, there are only six or seven truly competitive states, and some of those states will be decided by as few as 10, 10 to 20,000 votes. So anything, any person, right, anything that siphons a group of usually reliable voters away could be a deciding factor. By saying this, they're suggesting, as they say here, Kennedy's popularity, he's pulling around 10% in election polling averages, complicates the strategy for the Biden campaign, suggesting again, he's going to make Biden lose in all those states based on polling, which they say is seeking to make November's vote a binary choice between the president and Trump, right? Uh, Biden's fighting two sides now, in other words. But it says as well, 
that RFK Jr. has enough support to compete in six states and is aiming to raise one million signatures to qualify in all 50 U.S. states. And that is not to, of course, write off the possibility that people will write in his name even if he's not on the ballot. Now, the corporate media is running with the narrative against RFK Jr. And I would note this is after he announced his pick for vice president, and this seems to really set them off, frankly. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute. Look, remember also, the Biden campaign, they view Kennedy, RFK Jr., as a serious, serious threat, and they are launching a full campaign to attack him. Remember, for the most part, the Democrat Party right now is not campaigning on successes. What do they have? Uh, the economy? <laughs> the border? Um, I don't know. What, what do they got, right? Uh, rather than campaign on accomplishments, they're campaigning on attacking their political enemies. They're campaigning through weaponized justice, hoping that Trump gets arrested, hoping that'll change polling data. They're campaigning by rehashing old disinformation, though even the Trump-Russia hoax coming back up again. They're campaigning by framing things on false premise, and they're campaigning, notably, by just trying to attack and tear down the other side of the aisle. Uh, but it's not working. In fact, even Barack Hussein Obama is telling Biden to stop doing that because he says it's not working. He's urging Biden instead to focus on your accomplishments. But ABC News notes this because, again, they're trying this against RFK Jr. now. And at least in my opinion, if they attack RFK Jr. and RFK Jr. doesn't fold, which I doubt he will, uh, frankly, it's not going to work, and more likely it's going to have the opposite effect. They're probably going to make him more popular because of it, ironically. ABC News says Democrats are leaving no room for doubt on how they view former party colleague turned independent presidential candidate uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and his freshly minted vice presidential pick, deep-pocketed lawyer Nicole Shanahan. The pair are a danger to voters and present a spoiler ticket, they say, destined to siphon votes from President Joe Biden and deliver the White House to former President Donald Trump. Now, I would note on this, they're not being totally unsensible by saying that. The reality is, RFK Jr. is probably going to be the Ross Perot to, to this whole thing. You know what I mean? He's going to split the vote. Uh, he probably, if he continues to campaign and he continues to do what he's doing, he probably will split the vote. And it will probably, it will probably be split in a way that does, in fact, siphon votes mostly from Biden and probably lead to a Trump victory. In my personal opinion, though, what RFK Jr. is trying to represent is what the Democrat Party used to be this more centrist, classical, liberal type party that still has all the main Democrat talking points. They still believe in anti-gun narratives. They still believe in uh, abortion, although even Trump is kind of, he's saying it should be on the states, not the federal government. So even he is kind of not fully on board with that right now. Uh, but RFK Jr. very much does represent the old school kind of positions of the Democrat party. And for a lot of Democrats who say, I didn't leave the Democrat Party, the Democrat Party left me, RFK Jr. represents the party that, again, they, that they actually believed in, frankly. And so what he's doing, I personally believe, is trying to restore the Democrat Party and to seize it back from what has become, a, ironically, a combination of establishment you know, hacks and radicals, essentially. And then, of course, a lot of people who are still in between on that, feeling that they're pulled in both of these directions. Uh, really, the Democrat Party, after Trump emerged on the political scene, the old school Republicans kind of merged with them, and so they became the establishment party. And of course, because of the grassroots and George Soros money and so on, they also got a lot of radicals, the squad, the Democrat Socialists of America types. Uh, people who, you know, it used to be that Bernie Sanders was like the most extreme socialist they had. Now there's a whole clique within the party of very extreme people who they can't afford to go against because they will split the party. And what they're risking right now is a fracturing of the whole party, which I'd say they're actually suffering. Let's be real in the situation the Democrat Party is facing right now. You have the old school Democrats. These old school Democrats don't believe with the establishment, like, you know, the pro-war types and so on. They typically don't go with that. 
Uh, they typically don't agree with, you know, the big corporate money and so on like that, which has found its way into the party mainly through that kind of establishment system. And typically as well, they don't also agree with the far left, the socialists and communists. Again, that was regarded as a more extreme branch of the Democrat Party. The, again, environmentalist types more go to the Green Party already, but the Democrat socialist types, they become the kind of the far left steering the direction of it. Now, the, the, the Democrat Party does not just risk a breakaway from the moderates. They also risk a breakaway from the far left. And ironically, Israel, Gaza, and the whole conflict there is causing that division to now take place as well, suggesting that the far left of the Democrat Party, the squad types, which are kind of new entries, by the way, uh, but of course, they were not able to fully distance themselves from them without breaking the party, which is why they've been pulled in more extreme directions, by the way. Uh, they're risking a breakaway from that system as well. And so the Democrats risk breaking into two or even three different parties, depending on how this plays out. And frankly, if they lose the moderates to RFK Jr., which is now in the process of happening, that means the party will merely be the establishment, the pro-war types and so on, and the big corporate types and so on, ironically, which I would say most traditional Democrats were not for. And ironically, the socialists who are just completely opposed to each other. The socialists are the pro-Gaza. The pro-war ones are the pro-Israel. The socialists are the pro-anti-corporation you know, anti -corporation ones. The established ones are the pro-corporation ones. They are diametrically opposed to each other. And there's no way the party will hold if they lose the moderates. The Democrat party will fracture if this takes place. And frankly, I'd say they're already in the process of that. If you look, for example, at the breaks and seams arising over the Israel-Palestine argument, if you look, for example, at some of the breakaways taking place among the trans narratives and so on, uh, that process is right now happening. And it's not looking like they're going to be able to hold the party together. And so in this context, keep in mind what AFP and others are saying, because they say this, continuing on. They say in a Democratic National Committee press call on Tuesday night, several party surrogates, Democrats, called RFK Jr. Kennedy's presidential bid disgusting and a ploy to re-elect Trump. And it's at Shanahan, his new VP, RFK Jr., who has donated millions of dollars to a pro-Kennedy super PAC, partly bankrolled half of the $7 million used to create an ad that ran... Th that ran during this year's Super Bowl and displeased several members of Kennedy's extended family and its riffing on a John F. Kennedy Jr. campaign ad. It notes that the DNC, the Democrat Party, has sharpened its messaging significantly, assembling a team to combat third party and independent challengers, I wonder who that is, uh, which includes veteran strategist and firebrand Liz Smith, with much of that ammo pointed directly at Kennedy and now Shanahan. It says of this tactic, to combat Kennedy and other potential challenges by the official arm of the Democrat Party is a marketed change from the past cycles when concerns about third party challengers such as Green Party's Jill Stein and Libertarian Gary Johnson were met with much less public consternation. Now, given that situation, one of the reasons why I think the Democrat Party in the past did not attack third party candidates, and I would say Green Party takes more votes from Democrats. Libertarian Party is it's a bit funny, right? Libertarians are technically classical liberals, um, suggesting, of course, they might be more with the Democrats, but tend to be more free market. And so I would say, actually, they probably take a little more votes from, from the Republicans. Um, the Democrats typically did not attack these other parties, though, because doing so would often mean challenging positions which they would see as maybe divisive for their own voters. 
If they attack the Green Party, they're attacking the environmentalists. If they attack the Libertarian Party, they're attacking free market people, and they're attacking, of course, classical liberalism, which many of the moderates of the Democrat Party tend to believe in. And if they attack RFK Jr., they're attacking the moderates of the party, meaning the only ones they're not attacking are the pro-corporate, pro-war, and far-left branches. Um, which, again, I think, ironically, the method they're using of attack, and frankly, I think even harmony is off the table, so maybe this is all they have left, that method will have the effect of further dividing their party, based on the way I'm seeing it, at least. You know, I want to hear your opinions. Let me know what you all think. But look, with that being said, it seems the main Democrat campaign against Trump was to try to put him in jail. Remove him from the ballot. They tried to use the 14th Amendment to remove Trump's name from the ballot to protect democracy. And just hope that they could destroy his reputation badly enough that nobody would vote for him. And that approach has failed. It has failed incredibly. Trump now appears to even be using it. He is openly daring a judge, saying, I dare you, to put a who put a gag order on him to throw him in jail because Trump says, I'm not going to follow the gag order. What are you going to do? Throw me in prison? Do it. Trump saying, yeah, make me the next, uh, ne make me the next Mandela. Do it, right? The Post Millennial says, on Saturday, Donald Trump expressed that he would consider it a great honor to face imprisonment if he violated a gag order because he doesn't stay quiet when he's running for president signaling a heightened level of criticism directed against uh, directed towards New York Supreme Court Justice Juan Merchan and other judicial figures involved in the Alvin Bragg trial in New York. And if you're like me, and folks, I do this for a living, I even get confused on who's overseeing which case because they have so many of them. And this is exactly what I said would take place. This is exactly what I said would happen. They have launched so many legal attacks on Trump that if you were to mention Alvin Bragg or Juan Mercan or, you know, any of these other figures, you no longer even have a sense of which case they're overseeing. You just think, ah, oh, they're attacking Trump again. And that's how most people understand it. They're just attacking Trump again. Uh, what is that guy overseeing? I don't know. Just they're going after him. Uh, because when you overload people with too many attacks and too many narratives and too much stuff, they judge, they group the whole thing together and they create a meta narrative in their mind to make sense of it. This is how we categorize things. Uh, this is how we categorize things as humans. Most people are not going to be able to partition all of that. And so it just looks like they're attacking Trump, frankly. And that's how the narrative is being framed and the perception of most people, at least, you know, based on polling, frankly. Now it notes, on Monday, Mer Chan, the judge presiding over Trump's hush money trial, scheduled to commence on April 15th, which has happened like several times already now, by the way, broadened his gag order against Trump to encompass not only the judge's family, but also the family of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. Because remember, the people launching the political attacks on Trump are starting to have more controversy than even Trump is. Because we're finding that they're having affairs, that they're colluding with people who they're appointing to become prosecutors, that they're colluding with the Biden administration, that they're posting creepy, like, half-naked photos of themselves, and, you know, they're engaged in all kinds of creepy backdoor stuff. And frankly, they look like bigger criminals than Trump does for most people. And Trump's calling him out on it and saying he's, saying he's not going to stop doing it, by the way. Their family members are like major donors to the Democrats and stuff. Things that would make most people recuse themselves. Uh, they're becoming enshrouded with more of a picture of corruption than Trump is for many people. Now, notes that posting on his Truth Social account, Trump wrote, quote, now we have Mur Chan, who is not allowing me to talk, thereby violating the law and the Constitution all at once. It is so bad what he is trying to get away with. How was he even chosen for this case? This is Trump saying it, right? And he continues, I heard he fought like hell to get it, and all the rest of them also. If this partisan hack wants to put me in the clink for speaking the open and obvious truth, I will gladly become a modern-day Nelson Mandela. It will be my great honor. 
We have to save our country from these political operatives masquerading as prosecutors and judges, and I am willing to sacrifice my freedom for that worthy cause. We are a failing nation, but on November 5th, we will become a great nation again. Make America great again. And that's Trump saying that, of course, in his response to this gag order. Now, I would say that Trump is right on this. Even if Trump violates the gag order, it would be like a thousand dollar fine or they could put him in jail for a very short amount of time. The problem is, were they to jail Trump, that alone, aside from the, per, the perception of voters, aside from the image, again, as he said, of making him the next Nelson Mandela, aside from the fact that it would probably get him votes rather than take them away because it would look like he's being politically targeted and would probably very seriously help his campaign as we've ironically seen every time they announce a new charge against him. It doesn't work. Aside from that, though, we would have a constitutional crisis if they tried to throw a former president in prison. Former presidents are required to have a, uh, a Secret Service detail. Trump would be the baddest dude in like cell block four if they did that, you know what I mean? Uh, he would have like Secret Service in the cube with him, you know? Uh, Trump would be like, you know, the baddest dude around if that, if that happened. And frankly, they probably couldn't do it at most. They could probably, they could probably do like, you know, lock him in his house. Uh, they have to, he has to like stay in his house or something like that. Uh, but even that would be very difficult, again, because it's an election season, and Trump could probably challenge that on constitutional grounds, frankly, and maybe even win. In other words, they're empty threats, and Trump seems to become increasingly aware of this. And even if they're not empty threats, if the judges go ahead with it anyway, which they might, right? If they go ahead with it anyway, because it is so controversial, and because of the constitutional challenges of them doing that, it makes the judges look worse than Trump. And this is what has been happening case by case and you know, part by part every single time. This is what has been happening. The judges and the prosecutors and the people involved in the cases and the people involved in manufacturing the cases, the again, special counsel, they are looking more corrupt than Trump. And because, again, this is viewed as a type of weaponization of justice by not just Trump supporters, but even a lot of moderate Democrats, look at RFK Jr., for example, uh, because that is how it is being viewed by a lot of the country, that corruption, that image of all these judges, that is directly being projected onto Biden and his campaign. In other words, Biden cannot fully separate himself from the damage to the image that is taking place of these judges and prosecutors. It is all being reflected back on him. Um, and so, ironically, this is how Trump's kind of campaigning. And one of the ways he's doing it, he's still doing actual campaign events, right? But re remember also that it's not just Trump facing legal attacks. It's also many of his former associates. And some of them are actually fighting back, especially as the cases run into controversies that are making the people, again, behind them look like the real criminals. Epic Times, for example, says, a defendant in the Trump classified documents case. And mind you, Joe Biden also, according to the special counsel, was taking classified documents before he was president. And the, the special counsel says that he can't be charged with it because he's incapable mentally of standing in front of a jury. Aside from that, they're still going after Trump for the thing they're not going after Biden for. But they say a defendant in the Trump classified document case said he will give Fulton County, Georgia, District Attorney Fannie Willis until April 8th to recuse herself. Otherwise, he will pursue legal action amid allegations that she illegally recorded his lawyer's phone call which I would say violates a couple laws. It violates, of course, attorney-client privilege. How do you record the phone call between an attorney and the attorney's client? You, that never happens. You can't do that. And not only that, but uh, surreptitious recording is illegal in, this state, in that state, right? But let me continue. It says that last week, Chris uh, Kacharoff, an attorney for defendant Harrison Floyd, uh, alleged in an interview that Miss Willis recorded a call between her and one of his Maryland-based colleagues without their knowledge or consent. And he said, quote, 
She did not reach out to us, one of my colleagues in Maryland, and was rude, abrupt with him on the phone. Uh, sorry, she did reach out to us, and she was rude, abrupt with him on the phone, and he was dealing with the Maryland case, and I was dealing with the Georgia case, and she ended up recording him. It notes that Mr. Kacharov said that in the interview, and he noted that under Maryland law, quote, it's a felony to record someone without both parties' consent. It's a felony, folks. In other words, DA Fannie Willis probably committed a felony. Again, if what he says is true about her recording without their consent. And that suggests, of course, that she's trying to use this illegal recording as part of the case, which, look, you know, I'm a journalist. I know that if you record somebody illegally um, in, in a state where you can't do it, and you try to use that, even, for example, in a prosecution, uh, one of the cases I was taught when I was in journalism school, right, and this is a real case, I can't remember the exact, the exact details on it, but I can tell you the general picture, there was a case, and this is one of the cases I was taught as a journalist, uh, where there was an individual suspected of murder. Journalists went to the individual's house to try to interview him about the allegations. The individual declined to be interviewed, but then he went out on his balcony and he was talking on the phone. The journalists, having, again, good equipment and good cameras, pointed their camera, which had a telescopic mic, a telescopic microphone, meaning you could record at that type of distance, were able to record his phone call as he was standing on his own balcony. And when they did that, the individual in his phone call admitted to murder. This has nothing to do with the Fannie Willis case, by the way, at least on that thing, but it's relevant in terms of how cases work, by the way, so hear me out. The journalist, in other words, recorded evidence of this guy admitting to murder on his balcony during a private phone call. They wrote a story on it, and what ended up happening was, because the journalists, during the investigative process, where again, you know, police and so on were looking into the case, they ended up having the entire case thrown out. The individual literally got away with murder, literally. Uh, because what was deemed the legal case was that the journalists interfered with the investigative process by using an illegal recording. And the illegal recording then could not be used as evidence because it was, it was obtained illegally. The individual was standing on private property, his own balcony, and of course he was surreptitiously recorded, meaning it could not be used in the court of law. And so the journalists, by doing that, ironically got the entire case thrown out and the guy literally got away with murder. Now, apply that to what we're watching right here. <laughs> the DA on the case uh, surreptitiously recorded somebody is trying to use this illegal, illegally created recording uh, during a court case. Not only is this, again, the... DA in this case, right? The uh, sorry, the uh, the prosecutor getting involved in the actual legal investigation of this whole process, right? In, in this regard, but doing so in an illegal manner, and then trying to include evidence obtained what is alleged to be done in an illegal way in the court case, um, and then of course refusing to recuse herself despite this and other clear conflicts of interest which again have become one of the bigger controversies of the case. I think people are paying more attention to the problems in the case at this point than they are against the allegations against Trump, frankly. Not to mention the fact that the same thing Trump's being accused of here is what Biden was found to be knowingly guilty of, ironically, by, uh, by special counsel Hur's investigation into him, by the way. But back on this. It notes, Maryland is one of 11 states that require two-party consent in order for a phone call to be or electronic communication to be recorded. Under Maryland's Wiretap Act, recording a conversation without consent can be punishable by upward of up to five years in prison, a fine of up to $10,000 or both. And they're saying Fannie Willis did that, right? Now, meanwhile... This whole system of two-tiered justice goes forward, as this is all happening. It's becoming even more glaringly clear that there is a very different system on the other side of the political aisle, right? They're facing a very different system of law, whereas the Trump side seems to have a very strict system of law. The Biden side doesn't, frankly. 
And Daily Wire says that White House visitor logs show that an attorney for Hunter Biden met with one of First Lady Jill Biden's top aides, as well as President Joe Biden himself, days before the president's son, Hunter Biden, defied a congressional subpoena, the New York Post reported Saturday. It notes that Hunter's attorney, Abe Lowell, had a meeting with Anthony Burrell, who has been an aide for Jill Biden since 2008 in the East Wing of the White House on December 11th, 2023, according to the uh, New York Post. It notes that visitor logs also show that Lowell met with Joe Biden, but the Post noted that meeting was most likely in the context of an official Hanukkah reception held the same day, but they said, quote, We've called on the White House to provide information about whether President Biden sought to influence or obstruct our investigation by preventing, discouraging, or dissuading his son from complying with the subpoena for a deposition as part of the White House Rep as part of the House of Representatives impeachment inquiry. But the White House has refused to provide any information. That's according to the House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer. Uh, now, folks, remember. This is actually similar to what Trump associate Roger, uh, Roger Stone was being accused of. And they threw the book at him. They went after him. That's the same Roger Stone the FBI did a pre-dawn raid on. Remember they like hopped in the little like little inflatable rafts across his like three foot river? They, they, they actually had little inflatable rafts and they paddled across this little jetty like maybe as wide as my desk right now, you know? And then did a pre-dawn raid on the guy, that Roger Stone? Because they accused him, notably, of tampering with the witness. Remember, if Hunter Biden was in any way advised to violate the congressional subpoena, it could represent a similar crime. And the question is, will he be held to the same legal scrutiny as the Trump side is being held to? And again, again if they don't, maybe even if they do, this is further creating the image of a two-tiered system of justice, and yes, a system of politically weaponized justice. And folks, that said, let's jump into some questions, because I went a bit long today. All right. Wild times, folks. And of course, we'll be covering all of this a whole lot more as we all go forward, because it's wild times and it's not showing any signs of slowing down, let's put it that way. All right, let's see here. Um, from California guy, he's saying, Joshua, would you please explain the benefits of the Electoral College? What's a simple explanation we can give others who ask? Um, okay, so the Electoral College basically makes sure that states have equal or relatively equal representation in the federal elections. Uh, because what would happen, remember, America is not just you know, a bunch of, it's not just a federal government. And I think this is, I talked about this a bit yesterday, right? America is not just one government. We are 51 governments. There are 50 states. Every state has its own government, its own Congress, has its own governor, who is very much like a prime minister of a normal country. Many American states have the population, the size, the power, and the economy of some of the most powerful countries on the face of the planet. And again, the very nature of, an Amer of a republic, of the system we have of federalism, is that these countries, the 50 states, and every state technically is like a country, are united also under a meta-government, a federal government, right? Uh, the empire, the, the, federal, the federal system. Now, when the states agreed to be part of that, they, they wanted to make sure they maintained some degree of sovereignty, that they would not be held to the dictates of the bigger states. Why, for example, would one of the Midwest states want to be part of the federal government if they got no benefit from it, if they had no representation within the system? Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why, of course, the Electoral College was formed, to make sure that during the presidential elections, the states with the largest populations don't become the dictators of the republic. Because what would happen without the Electoral College is that California, New York, and possibly Texas, their votes would decide the direction of all 50 states. And so, you know, the entire country, essentially, most of the states would not be fully represented in the halls of, well, and maybe in the halls of Congress, but not represented through the president. And so, 
they wanted to make sure the voices of the people of those states were heard. And again, I've noted that over the course of U.S. history, the, the sovereignty and the power of the states has been gradually whittled away to the extent now that a lot of people no longer have state identity. A lot of people no longer fully understand the sovereignty of states. A lot of people no longer understand the relationship between state government and federal government, right? This is, it's all become kind of diluted because federal is federal, you know, the federal system, right? Uh, they have grown so much in power and grown so much in terms of different agencies and so on that they have replaced in many, in many regards uh, the powers and the systems and what the states are doing. And I think because of that, people now no longer fully understand why the, why the Electoral College exists and why it's important for the very nature of our form of government. Again, uh, a, a republic of states, right? A federal, a federal system. Uh, they no longer fully understand why that's important. And so if you wanted to sum it up for maybe talking to a friend, uh, we have the Electoral College to make sure that we don't live under like a three-state dictatorship, frankly. You know, there's no point in having, there's no point in middle America being part of the federal government if they are not represented through it. And the Electoral College makes sure that they, as states, have a voice within our political system. Um, again, otherwise, why even be part of it? It, it was one of, the, one of the things they had to do in order to create a union of states, um, which is you know, pretty important, right? William Melk, you're saying, the government sucks the thrill out of fun, the comfort out of luxury, the ownership out of property, the value out of money, the pleasure out of joy, the purpose out of meaning, and the happiness out of life. And I would add to that, and the money out of our pockets. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm half joking here. I, I, I do think, I'm not like, you know, I, I believe that government has its place. I, I, don't, I don't think we should, you know, I think anarchy actually is just as dangerous as communism. And in fact, the relation, just to explain this a bit, right? And the relationship between anarchy and communism is often misunderstood. Um, anarchy, like we can go back to history. William Godwin, for example, uh, the father of Mary Shelley, by the way, who wrote Frankenstein, also a necromancer. A lot of people don't realize that history of him. In fact, he wrote a book, The History of Necromancy. Um, he was very creepy. Uh, he, he was a radical atheist, and he believed in his interest in necromancy that he could disprove the existence of the human soul by merely finding ways to repair a human body and reanimate it. Maybe that was an influence of Mary Shelley's book, Frankenstein, right? Uh, but he was a radical anarchist. And the nature of anarchy during his time, right? And I'm just explaining anarchy here. And the nature of the anarchist revolutions as they're related to socialism was always this. Uh, anarchists believe in achieving personal, commun personal um, socialism to achieve what they call intentional communism. And so, whereas, or sorry, they, they practice personal anarchy to achieve intentional socialism or communism. Because this is how the debates were divided. Let me explain this a bit better. Socialists, or let's say communists at the time, believed that in order for society tra to transition to the religious belief of the communist utopia, you needed to have a period of tyranny through which the state would seize the means of production and then use the powers and levers of the state to destroy religion, tradition, belief, everything, right? That you needed to eliminate the old world formed through a belief in God and the cultures formed through beliefs in God. In other words, they needed to decouple humanity from the divine. That was the basis of communism, which is why every communist movement has basically waged war against organized religion. Communism has always represented a war against God more than anything else. Um, that's really the nature of what they do. They don't get rid of the factories. They don't get rid of the corporations. They merely seize them from the people and then detach them from the elements of tradition, family, belief, culture, everything, right? Communists believe that the state of socialism is the necessary step on the way to achieving the full annihilation of tradition and religion that communism represents. But anarchists in the debates of the early communists believe that they could achieve the same outcome through what they called personal anarchy, 
where the anarchist, rather than needing a tyrannical form of government to destroy these things, merely destroys these things within themselves. They destroy their belief in God. They destroy their belief in tradition. They destroy their belief in hierarchy. They destroy all of these things until they have achieved what they call intentional communism. That was the system advocated by William Godwin, um, again, the father of Mary Shelley. Now, um, this is also one of the reasons why you can have anarcho-communists, which a lot of people, when we understand communism, merely as, again, the dictatorship of the proletariat or a tyrannical government. It doesn't make sense. But if you understand communism as a religion, a religion that necessitates a system to destroy the old world, uh, which is what the tyrannical, the tyranny of communist practice typically represents, it then makes sense, right? That being said, though, traditional belief in the necessity of government was based more so on the hierarchy of the divine. The belief that there's a type of divine order, and this is held both in the East and in the West. In the West, um, they talked about the idea that, for example, that there's a hierarchy of heaven, right? The, they call it the divine hierarchy. God, the angels, uh, humanity, right, going down to kings, down to knights and lords and, you know, barons and so on, down to, again, landowners, down to the peasants, down to fathers or grandfathers and fathers and family structures and so on. So this type of hierarchy of power, basically, is what connects us to the divine. That, that, that's the theory of the divine hierarchy, which was an essential part of Catholicism and most traditional religion. The same thing existed in the East, uh, where they believed that the emperor follows heaven and, of course, the people follow the emperor, right? And notably, they believed that if the emperor stopped following heaven, then people had the divine need and the divine right to overthrow the emperor. Um, it was the same basic concept, this type of a, an unbroken chain of law that creates the law of heaven in the human world. That is, that is a traditional religious belief. Communism and anarchy are a revolt against the, this divine system of law, right? Where they teach every level below to revolt against the one above, um, which is, of course, um, you can understand it as a type of uh, metaphysical rebellion. It is a metaphysical rebellion. And Satan is the, is the metaphysical rebel, would represent, of course, that type of rebellion, right? The children against the parents, the parents against each other, between men and women, uh, the people against their landlords, the people against the lords, the people against the kings, the kings against heaven, and so on, right? The revolt at every single level of the chain that represents divine law in the human world. That is what communism is. And anarchy is a key part of that, but with a different belief on how to achieve it, basically. That being said, um, even though I do criticize tyrannical law, I have no issue whatsoever with government. I think it is a good and necessary uh, force in the world, one that represents something based in tradition, and one that, if practiced well, can be a blessing to humanity. My problem with a lot of what we see these days, though, is it has become corrupted. And I would regard that element of corruption to be communist influence. And so I am an open anti-communist. I'm a very strong anti-communist. So you all know where I stand, right? Um, but I very much believe in traditional government, very much so. Uh, you as citizen on the ground, you're saying, is there any respect for the Democrat Party now that it has been chosen to apply socialist policies? In case in point, they have fully agreed. I think that is the problem with the Democrat Party, is that they have adopted socialism. They have allowed the radicals to influence their party. I believe that, frankly, debates between right and left are not necessarily a bad thing. I think that, you know, again, having two different sides of an argument is a good thing. I'd say traditional dialectics teach us, you know, the Socratic dialectic teach us how to have civil conversations between diametrically opposed ideologies. And that through these conversations, we can oftentimes arrive at higher truth. That is the basis of traditional dialectics, our ability to communicate with each other and to find truth and find common ground. I believe, though, that communism is outside the boundaries of the normal dialectic. 
It is outside the boundaries of the normal right and left. It, re it represents a satanic system that looks to drive a wedge between the relations of people, which is, of course, the nature of why the Catholic Church used to excommunicate communists. You can read it, by the way. They talk specifically about dialectical materialism, which is the dialectic theory of Marxism, right, which believes in driving a wedge between people. Uh, the theory is based on the idea of identify, contradict, and eliminate the middle. So rather than create harmony, it seeks to divide. That's, that's the difference of the communist dialectic. It seeks to sharpen antagonisms, as the Catholic Church explained it. Um, it seeks to divide people rather than create harmony. And of course, by dividing people, manufacture conflicts in an attempt to tear society apart. The progressives believe this is part of social, you know, social evolution. They apply the Darwinist theory of survival of the fittest and the idea that the, that process of struggle, as Hegel would put it, conflict leads forward, um, is a type of social evolution. That's their theory. But if you go deeper into the ideas of communism, it was actually about destroying society. The deeper belief in communism is, again, based on the Hegelian concept of what they call the negation of the negation, the destruction of an existing system, with the belief that something magically will come out of it, which is the argument Karl Marx used, by the way, uh, to try to say that you, know, you can't argue on whether communism works or not because it's something that doesn't exist, frankly. You know, he says you have to destroy it to get it. You gotta, you gotta pass it to find out what's in it, right? as Nancy Pelosi might put it. You gotta, you gotta pass it to find out what's in it which she said when they were passing Obamacare, you might remember. Um, it's this thing, right, that they, it was the idea of destroying society. That's, that's what communism is about. And I would say that it has been detrimental to the Democrat Party that they've allowed the extreme left, and I'd even hesitate on calling it the left because communism can exist within the right and the left. If you read uh, Ludwig von Mises, for example, um, his book, Socialism, he explains this very well. Or, or read a book, again, I talk about it often, called um, Planned Chaos. He explains this very well. Communism is a type of dialectical disharmony. It, it seeks to divide people. And you can apply it within any political system. And unfortunately, the Democrats have allowed people expressing that type of belief to dictate the party because they don't want to push them out because they, they don't want to, you know, fracture their party. I would say that, you know, Barack Obama played a big role in cementing that element within the Democrats, um, just as much as Donald Trump had a big role of cementing this more populist idea within the Republicans that, again, changed the party in different ways, right? Uh, this idea of renewing America. Obama represented the opposite of changing America into what seemed to be a communist country, frankly. And so this fundamental change within our party system completely altered the system that we have. And unfortunately, I think until the Democrats distance themselves from the socialists, which I believe they should, uh, they're going to be dragged down by them. And they're going to be continued to be painted within the same type of extremism we view those individuals in and be shrouded in the same level of frankly, just anger that a lot of people are now expressing against these radical policies. I think they need to distance themselves from those people. Uh, maybe some of the political shifts we have taking place right now will achieve that. Maybe RFK Jr. coming about um, and, again, retaking the moderates of the Democrat Party will change that. Maybe he will. Um, I don't agree with him on a lot of things. You know, I'm, I'm very much pro-Constitution, including pro-Second Amendment, so it doesn't align with me. But I can respect him. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can respect him. I can debate with people like that. I can have conversations with people like that. I don't agree with them, but I can talk to them. I, I, you know what I mean? This is what we used to have as a country, that we don't have to agree on things to have social harmony. And I would say a re restoration of traditional dialectics, the elements of harmony of opposites uh, that form countries and form nations and allow different tribes to to form unions, you know what I mean? This is necessary for the harmony of society, for us to be able to at least understand each other even if we don't agree with each other. Communism is diametrically opposed to that type of social harmony. 
And so that is the problem that we're facing, the, the essence of the problem we're facing, I believe. Uh, last, quite a, last question from Seymour Butts. You're saying there are a lot of people who think the Democrat Party is the same when JFK was alive. Not so, my friend. Um, that was before my time, so I don't fully remember. Uh, but I can say that even when I was a kid, the Democrat Party was a very different party than what it is now. Remember, like, Donald Trump used to be a Democrat. You know what I mean? Like, they've changed a lot. And the Republican Party changed a lot. You know, the, the party of George Bush was a very different party. And so, yeah, we're, we're not dealing with the same parties we used to know. They, they have changed fundamentally. And I think that now what we're now facing is more debate, again, as I always say, between freedom and socialism. This is the fundamental debate we're having as a society. Do you want freedom or do you want socialism? You can't have both. All right, folks, that said, um, end it today. Actually, I'll do one more from Ashley from California. You're saying, who will hold the government accountable for violating the Constitution? Hopefully the American people. <laughs> because uh, that's the way our system works. All right, folks, that said, uh, I do think things are changing, frankly, and I think that truth coming out is a big part of that. Um, we've been talking a lot about January 6th. I would urge all of you, if you have not seen the documentaries we've done yet, I've done two documentaries and a special feature, working with my colleagues, um, about January 6th. And these included a lot of unreleased footage and a lot of information the public should know, frankly. Uh, because this is one of the big narratives shaping a lot of the discourse right now, especially during the elections. I highly recommend you watch these. Let me show you a trailer before we go. Uh, real quick though, also again, that's only on Epic TV. So those of you on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, head over to Epic TV, check it out. Um, even if you just subscribe and just watch the documentaries, go do it. I think you'll thank, your, you'll thank yourself for it. I think you'll come out of it with a better understanding of what has been taking place in this country and let me know what you think, frankly, you know? Um, also, while you're a subscriber, you can come join the Q&As, and I'd love to have you over there. So, epochtv.com. And folks, thank you so much. As always, thank you for being here. I'll see you tomorrow, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. And as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you. Calling the January 6th investigation the biggest investigation in FBI history. There are more than 1,100 arrests, and they show no signs of, of slowing down. When you take an oath, you have to abide by it. They're just going to identify you on video, arrest you, and then figure out what the evidence is after that. Those involved must be held accountable. He's an innocent man. And he has been punished for something that he never did. Every day you wake up and you're like, how did I get out of bed today? You have to stay away from the word patriot now because that's a uh, terrorist organization. We interviewed two whistleblowers from the FBI. I sacrificed my dream job to share this information with the American people. That siege was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic terrorism. We started with death threats, uh, the hate mail. I don't care what they do to me, but I do care what they do to my family. Our family struggles every day. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is.